Pokemon, the most prolific media franchise in the world, a topic we are all going to hear about as long as we're not living under a rock, and a topic I am drawn to once again on this channel. Years ago, I made a short video expressing my disenchantment with the series upon witnessing a remarkably unimpressive announcement trailer for Pokemon Sword and Shield. Little did I know that this was before things were going to get really bad. I skipped those games, Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, and even Legends Arceus, despite many people claiming it was a surprisingly enjoyable time. I wasn't interested. It wasn't as simple as the new game sucking, because I felt bored with the games I used to like as well. I truly thought that I had grown out of Pokemon, and was okay saying that it wasn't for me anymore. But something within me changed when I saw Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. My interest was reinvigorated, ironically not through the game that touted a new direction, but through the somewhat more traditional Generation 9. So I basically want to have a more updated video, something more nuanced for my current position on Pokemon. Because I think the gravitational pull of this series is a bit more complex than nostalgic cycles or whatever. I'm gonna talk about some bad, I'm gonna talk about some good, but what I'm playing at today is why with Pokemon, I can't look away. But you know, on the topic of buying Pokemon games, I'm sure you're thinking, Uncle Jebtube, I want to catch them all, but to do that, I'm going to need a secure place for a no doubt copious amount of cash and credit. Well, look no further, because today's video is sponsored by the Ridge Wallet. That's right, Ridge is back and more rigid than ever. I've been using their extra durable, extra compact wallet for the past month, and it has been swell. Nothing quite compares to whipping out this piece of cold steel like <laughs> yeah. This thing can hold up to 12 cards and still fit snugly in your pocket. It's pretty amazing. You know what they say, the best gifts come in small packages. And for the holiday season, no truer words can be spoken for Ridge's excellent lineup. In fact, if you head over to ridge.com slash jebtube, you can get up to 40% off between now and December 22nd. That's a crazy deal over at ridge.com slash jebtube. I sincerely recommend it. Thank you very much. Of course, if I'm going to talk about why I chose to play Pokemon Violet, the question presents itself. Why wouldn't I? I mean, it should be pretty easy to say that I don't want to spend $60 every year for games that practically smell like they came hot off the conveyor belt. Games that are clearly rushed, clearly compromised, clearly unoptimized, and clearly not capable of reaching some basic industry standards. If almost any other video game series operated like the core Pokemon games, they would surely die out. Mario Party used to be spammed every year, just like Pokemon, but eventually, they stopped doing it. Mega Man used to be churned out on the regular, but that's obviously not the case anymore either. Pokemon is just built different. It can make so much money out of such little investment. Everyone's talked about how deeply troubled this series is. Everyone's given their own way to fix the Pokemon problem. And I often echo these sentiments. But at the end of the day, it doesn't usually go anywhere. You'd believe that one of the richest video game companies ever created would put some money into correcting these shortcomings, but the reality is, there is no reason for the Pokemon company to change the way it does things other than out of the goodness of their hearts. Unlike, say, Sonic, which I think would be more enjoyable and profitable from making better, healthier decisions, Pokemon does not share the same luxury. They could hire some more animators, but would that really make them more money? They could hire voice actors, but, well, do they really have to? They could heighten the music by employing a wide array of instruments and performers, or I guess the same clangy drum sample isn't broken. It truly is more financially viable for Pokemon's potential to suffer. It cannot be understated that Pokemon is a monolith because it perfected the art of renewal and replenishment long ago. There's an unparalleled business formula for merchandise, trading cards, television, and video games. 
Games which utilize the same format and incrementally build on it slowly but surely. Just enough to where it is always familiar, but not a repackaging. Uh, except for the times where it plainly was a repackaging, but these days we have DLC. If you want to hear more about the topic of Pokemon's success through stagnation, there's this great video from a year back that I've somehow never seen till now. It addresses the issue with far more clarity than I could ever offer, so that's a load off my script. And don't worry, I'm not getting lazy now, I'm just putting it out there for supplementary material. After all, this video is about why I still follow this transparently corporate entity. If the stories are bland and the visuals are gross and the music is midi and the gameplay is stale, then why would anyone over the age of 12 want to play these games? For years, I didn't think there was a true answer to that. I once believed that Pokemon didn't offer anything I couldn't get better elsewhere. But there is one thing, one piece of the puzzle that I hadn't really considered. Something so natural as breathing that, of course, I missed it. That thing is... Pokemon. No, not the brand, I mean... Pokemon. Yeah, okay, so that probably sounds pretty stupid. Wow, the appeal of the monster-catching game is the monsters? No way! But I promise I'm not trying to waste your time. Yes, it's true. Behind the kitty stigma and all the crummy monetary choices, I think for a lot of people it doesn't get any more complicated than that. Pokemon are just appealing, even for a jaded bastard like me, apparently. Now, why does Pokemon get this ethereal status and not Yu-Gi-Oh or Digimon? I, I don't know, dude. I never played those. I watched Digimon the movie, like, twice as a kid, I think. I can only speak on what I know, and what I know is that Pokemon designs were consistently the most exciting to me. There's something to be said about the Ken Sugimori art style. It's probably one of my favorites. It's striking when it needs to be, but the simplistic shading and mellow color palette always ensure that it's pleasing on the eyes. You can tell they've taken care to ensure that the art remains pretty consistent throughout the series, while also having room to improve. The Pokémon themselves, though, are also designed with balance in mind. I don't often feel that they are over-designed, nor the opposite extreme, and when they are, there's a contextual purpose behind it. Though this, I am never going to be okay with. What the fuck? But of course, artwork is only the first step towards inviting someone to play the games. Anyone could just appreciate a pretty picture and move on with their day, but people want to form connections with these Pokémon. And that leads to the bigger point of choice. After all, the phrase does go, I choose you. You choose a version of the game. You choose your starter. You choose your entire team. This makes every run a personal experience. To make these choices, you naturally would look into each Pokemon's appearance, or what they offer in battle, or maybe even which one has the most raw Pokedex entry. But the real secret ingredient, the thing that separates it from any other RPG that has choices of its own, is that Pokemon is a form of social expression. Nothing quite compares to the feeling of telling your friend about a shiny you caught, or the feeling of taking your carefully crafted lineup and facing off with other real people. In a sort of meta sense, it does become about the bond between humans and Pokemon, as in uh, us and our weird Nintendo products. We become so immersed in the virtual world of Pokemon, even if it's not really doing a great job prompting that. It's kind of bonkers. The act of catching new creatures alone is alluring, and the Pokemon company knows this because each new game is basically marketed as such. Each trailer is usually, hey, here's a new Pokemon, okay, bye. Or, hey, here's a new wacky trainer. Go draw something nice. Yeah, even the humans are significant enough to generate attention, and they just throw balls and point. Alas, this all may appear to be frivolous nonsense. Whoa, so the games include new characters? What fun. Guess it doesn't matter how good they are as long as they have new things. It raises the question of if Pokemon exists exclusively through nostalgia and brand loyalty. To which, I would say, if that were the case, there would surely be diminishing returns. Seems like there's more at play here, and if I were to guess, it would have something to do with Pokémon's possibly invincible generational system. 
Oh, Lord. I remember back in, like, uh, 2012, I was thinking, man, how many generations can Pokemon even have? Are we gonna get to Gen 10 and have, like, over a thousand Pokemon? Fast forward to 2022, and we're at Gen 9 with over a thousand Pokemon. Oh. And the worst part is the realization that people were asking that very same question back when I began playing. It makes you think. This Scarlet and Violet is to some new kid what Emerald was for me, which I guess is true about any long-running franchise, but with Pokemon there's clearly an intended purpose in that. That kid isn't just having their first Pokemon experience, they're likely having mine too, at least at its core. Beyond Pokemon Gold and Silver, the term sequel becomes less apt because each game is a new beginning. Indeed, a new generation. Almost every fragment of a Pokemon game's DNA will attempt to recreate the original feeling for the current demographic. Things like electric rodents, pseudo-legendaries, or villainous teams. It may seem asinine, but Pokemon retains interest exactly through iterations on the same thing. It's cultivated an endless cycle of old and new audiences. Just in time for one to grow weary of the routine, someone else will come and pick it up because they've heard so much about it. There's no barrier of entry, no overarching story, no expectation for prior knowledge. Each person will have their own formative adventure with Pokemon and will spread that to the people they know. It cannot truly be chalked up to brand loyalty as long as this explorative phenomenon happens, but it would also be selling it short to say that Pokemon is simply carried on the backs of children, or adults who were late to the party. As there are those who will lose interest, there are those who would stay to become more engrossed with Pokemon than the first-timer who is simply out to become a champion. Through this, I think we find Pokemon's true essence. Behind the baby's first RPG that we see marketed every year, there's a robust game that people have been studying for decades. A seasoned player will undergo rigorous trials to catch every Pokemon, or perhaps they will spend their days hunting for shinies. Of course, on the topic of hidden depth, you need not look further than the tried and true battle system. Leaving a player with only four move slots and relying on type effectiveness may be seen as a recipe for boredom. However, it's a gameplay loop that anyone can understand, which is exactly why it's satisfactory to grow with it and learn its intricacies like a trainer would within the Pokemon world. This incredibly simple premise can allow for strategy and variety purely through your own creativity with a six-man party. It may begin with tackle battles, but it could potentially end with you playing it as a genuine sport. It's an old, potentially tired tradition, but certainly not without reason. These things all come together to mean that Pokemon almost isn't even a game anymore. It's a language, and may be better described as an eternal sensation that people of all ages can easily share. Like, like fucking Christmas. You could even say that Pokemon is not a series of games, but one game that we experience through different versions. Oh, yeah, I can kind of see why they removed that word for their full price video games. What I intend to demonstrate here is that Pokemon's sameness is very much a conscious choice, at least in some higher up capacity. For many people, part of the fun is comparing and contrasting how each generation handles these archetypes. Which game has the best rival? Which game had the cooler starters? For better or worse, each region feels like an equal, consistent piece of Pokemon's Earth. But it may present the question, if Pokemon's identity is that of absurd consistency, does that mean it cannot improve and should not be criticized? No. If there's one thing I hate, it's the notion of shying away from genuine problems out of fear that you're part of a nostalgic circle jerk. You should be able to give your opinion regardless of what era you hail from. I would never be one to say, huh, yeah, well, back in my day, people complained about the games we like today, so you should just give up now because it'll all be pointless when the next generation rolls around. It doesn't really help anybody, just serves to shut down the conversation. I think there should be a conversation about the struggles of modern day Pokemon, and it shouldn't be this thing where we blame those biased Gen 5 kids or whatever. 
Personally, I think it's kind of disingenuous to say that Pokemon hasn't been at least a bit more problematic in recent years, but I will concede that this is only a result of a thing that's plagued the series since basically the beginning. What was a pretty novel and innovative idea in 1996 immediately became a goldmine that only a fool would leave alone. So begins the Pokemon spam, which would go from staggering semi-annual releases between regions to genuinely not skipping a year for six years straight. Of course, this is also counting updated versions that were sold at full price and included features that were plainly held off from the original counterparts. This was a lot easier to stomach back in the day though, because Pokemon kinda was like the king of the console. It's so likely that you bought a DS or a Game Boy Advance specifically so that you could play Pokemon. Back then, these games weren't off-putting from a visual standpoint, and the level of content present within each cartridge was kinda unreal. These were the big RPGs almost every year for so many people. Take that exact same release mentality and apply it to the far more demanding world of 3D, and you can assuredly see the cracks in this formula. Suddenly, on a console that allows or even expects a lot more out of a competition, Pokemon doesn't really seem so impressive. You can clearly tell that by X and Y they were running into some real issues adapting to this new landscape, so the games were played pretty safe pretty downscaled. But nonetheless, Pokemon would continue to be the sales juggernaut for all the same reasons as before. This leads us to the present issue, where Pokemon is finally on a home console, and yet, it surely does not feel like it. It makes you realize exactly why the core series didn't jump to console sooner. Its business model is simply designed for limited handhelds. But if it's all the same to the Pokemon company as long as they make money, then I guess we should just quit crying about it and vote with our wallets instead. That will surely show them that we don't support, uh, okay, maybe that's not gonna work. Well, what do we do now? Do we just accept this? Is giving a negative opinion only something we can do to combat the alternative of silence? Is the only thing left for Pokemon, inevitability. Honestly, maybe. I don't believe the root problem will ever go away. I don't believe Pokemon will ever not be compromised. Not until it financially crashes and burns. But I also want to call attention to the fact that it's not impossible for Pokemon to improve in smaller ways too. And that alone should be reason enough for people to express what they like and dislike about it. I mean, it's not like improvement never happens. It's not like they've literally been making Game Boy games all this time. Low bar, I know, but someone over there at Game Freak clearly is trying to improve the accessibility around the core premise, despite time restrictions that may prohibit greater change. As such, I find it kind of hard to go back to some of the older titles, and that's definitely not for nothing. Small changes from a design standpoint, such as HM removal, physical special split, and seamless battles genuinely add up and make the games more palatable. So, on the note of improvement, one thing I do want to bring up is the Dex Cut. Oh lord. There could be no greater example of Pokemon's struggle with inevitability than this. When, after 23 years, it's announced that you can no longer use every Pokemon in each game going forward, everyone is understandably a bit upset. However, I think it's fair to say that this was always going to happen at some point or another. This was unfortunately the risk they ran when implementing this transfer system all the way back in Gen 2. I mean, I think they ripped the band-aid off in the worst possible way, at the worst possible time, but could you actually imagine them programming these games forever with over a thousand Pokémon in mind? It may not seem like it, but there's a shitload of variables involved when doing that, even if many of them are transfer only. But you know, something that I think they could do to remedy this problem for a lot of people and still maintain their schedule would be to actually make a place where all these Pokemon could be used. 
A place where model animation is not a priority. A place where we get down to each creature as pure data and wouldn't have to worry about how they operate in a region. Basically, I would like it if they would let you battle and breed Pokemon in their paid cloud service. Don't think this will ever happen, but if it did, then they could more justifiably focus on a select group of Pokemon and gimmicks for each title while continuing to expand their scope. It'd be a lot nicer than having everyone cross their fingers for some Pokemon to be added back in post. That's what I figure anyway. Or, you know, it could also result in them deleting Pokemon Showdown. That, that would not be good. Man, I don't know. I guess for me it's like a matter of expectation. If they were publishing games every three or four years, I'd expect a lot more out of them. But now I've come to accept that this will not happen. It sucks that we have to settle for less with Pokemon. It sucks that baby steps have to be the improvement we seek. But unfortunately, that's the world we live in. Pokemon is not a victim of corporate greed. Pokemon is a victim of corporate existence. In the eyes of those who run it, Pokemon has achieved its true purpose. Almost any business would try to maintain that. So then, we are left with a choice. Do you take Pokemon, knowing full well that it will not reach its max potential, savoring glimmers of hope that we receive through the darkness, or do you leave it and pursue games that are not shackled by horrific deadlines and low budget? Or, I suppose a question for myself. What about Scarlet and Violet recaptured your interest despite it all? I guess the answer is that in it, I saw a glimpse of what I always imagined console Pokemon to be. The prospect of having a truly open world where I could walk freely with my Pokemon and even my real-life friends is all I apparently needed. It was the next step that I imagined the series would have back in 2019, the thing that could maybe push it closer to feeling like a real adventure. Just exploring the region atop a trusty companion, deciding which gym I want to go to, climbing the peaks to find a special Pokemon, but all in a more authentic fashion. It then hit me. I remembered exactly why it was that I enjoyed Pokemon in the first place. I enjoyed learning about the culture and mythology of each region. I enjoyed searching for my new favorite Pokemon and comparing notes with my friends. I wanted that sense of discovery again. Also, Pokemon Showdowns kind of got me by the balls. I still make teams every so often. So I got Violet, and uh... <laughs> yeah, the game is pretty rough. Even though I was lucky enough to not experience some of the horrific glitches I've seen online, the performance and visuals are quite inhibiting. Can't really ignore it. Genuinely does affect the experience a lot. But buried underneath all that shite, I found the treasure I was looking for. Once the game got going, I was flying all over the place, trying to grab all the sick new Pokemon. I made a regional team for the first time. I got to dick around with my friends a lot because the online worked surprisingly well. And I even enjoyed the story for what it was, though I won't spoil why. Many improvements have also been made to the core gameplay both in this game and the games I skipped, so it was pretty refreshing. It truly felt like the least restrictive Pokemon game, and to be honest, I think it's kind of amazing that they did make a game this big in so little time. I think there's a lot of room to improve, by no means did I think it was great, but I did actually have fun. At one point, I may have told you that I won't have fun with Pokemon so long as they don't toss everything out and make it a flashy action RPG, while also letting me keep every Pokemon I ever raised. I may have told you that as long as these games are targeting little Timmy, I ain't touching them. But here I am, making abominable sandwiches and washing my dolphin. Maybe all that time playing Final Fantasy XIV has warmed my heart and allowed me to appreciate the smaller things in life, who knows. But I can clearly see, in this game, that there is an effort to make the world of Pokémon more tangible, if even just a bit. Getting to the point where we can go anywhere we want as long as we are physically capable, looking for raid dens with my pals, it's all a step closer to that Pokémon MMO dream. 
It's a shame that I don't think Pokemon will ever again reach the peak that Gen 5 was for the standards of a console. Even if it did, maybe I wouldn't be as enthralled in it as I was back then. There's a special addicting energy to playing Pokemon at school and having to quickly snap back to reality when the teacher walks by, you know? But I guess that's why I found this game's academic setting so charming. There are games I played religiously as a kid that I couldn't tell you a thing about now. This one, though, lives in my head rent-free. It has a constant presence in this world and has a feverish energy that allows it a place alongside the games I unconditionally love. It may be battered and beaten, but the heart of the franchise is still there and attempting to grow. That's the diabolical thing about it but it's kind of brilliant in a way. There's just something about Pokemon, and only Pokemon, that brings me back to simpler times.